This means something. It's important. Quick show of hands. How many have seen the awesome Steven Spielberg science fiction movie from 1977, Close Encounters of the Third Kind? Awesome. I see a lot of hands going up in my imagination. It was a very popular movie, and it starred uh, an American actor named Richard Dreyfuss. Some of you remember Richard Dreyfuss. He may be still doing things now. But I remember he played a character named Roy in that movie. Roy was just a good old uh, guy, a, a, t a typical average Joe, and he's driving in his pickup truck one night, and all of a sudden, as he's driving down the road, he sees lights flashing in the sky. Now, he doesn't know if the Air Force is doing some sort of maneuvers or practicing with some new technology. He doesn't know if he's seeing something extraterrestrial or not. He just knows that he's seen something meaningful, something important, and he can't quite put his finger on it. There's something churning and burning within him. He feels so close to the truth, and yet he can't name it. He can't touch it. And so he struggles in the days to come. In fact, he has kind of a meltdown. He starts digging up the front yard and digging up the garden, ripping plants out of the garden. And he fills it in a wheelbarrow and drives the wheelbarrow over to the, the window to his living room. And he smashes all this stuff through the window onto his living room floor. And then out of all that yard waste, the, road, the debris, the mud, and all the dirt, he starts to, to form with his hands this giant sculpture a kind of model of a mountain right there in his living room. Better yet, a model of a butte. You know what a butte is. It's a mountain with the top shaved off, a flat top. He starts forming this butte in his living room, and he thinks if he can just shape it right, sculpt it just in the right way, he can figure out what it is that's burning and, and churning within him. Now, what's ironic is right beside him, as he's struggling to make this perfect model, his television is on. And we can see the television, and he's, he could see the television if he'd turn and look at it, but he doesn't. And on that television screen, we can see the nightly news playing, and on the nightly news, there's a mountain. It's a butte, a mountain with the top shaved off. And on the news, it seems to be reporting about the, the Air Force going out to this place in Montana and other people being told they have to leave, but he can't see it. It's almost as if we want to shout into the story. We want to shout at Roy and say, Roy, just turn and look at the screen. The truth you seek, it's right there under your nose. Well, at one point, Roy's wife is worried about him so much and worried about her kids. She packs the kids into the station wagon and says, I'm taking the kids to my mother's house. And as she uh, storms off in the car, he shouts to her, this means something. He points at the butte and says, this means something. It's important. Well, take a look at those two disciples walking down the Emmaus Road that day, making the seven-mile journey from Jerusalem to their hometown of Emmaus. They have a close encounter too, don't they? Theirs is a close encounter of a divine kind. And although they can't quite put their finger on it just yet, they don't have words for it just yet, their hearts churn and burn. They know that this means something, that it's important. Luke says that it was the same day that it happened. And when Luke says the same day, he means the very first Easter. It was the same day that the women had gone to, the, the, to, the, to anoint the body of Jesus and found the, the tomb was empty and an angel appeared and said, He is risen, go and tell the others. It's the same day that Mary met Jesus, the risen Christ, outside of the tomb on Easter and presumed He was the gardener until He used her name and said, Mary, and she said, Rabboni. It was the same day that the risen Christ appeared to the disciples in that locked room where they had met and breathed on them and blessed them with peace and charged them to go and bring forgiveness to the world. It was that same day, says Luke, that this uh, disciple, two disciples were walking down the Emmaus Road that they met a stranger. 
Now, Luke doesn't really tell us precisely who this couple is, who these two disciples are, but he uses the name Cleopas, and that's important. It's almost as if Luke, uh, by using that name, assumes we're going to know who these, these two disciples are. You know that name Cleopas shows up, or at least a very close rendition of it shows up in John's Gospel. When uh, John tells us about the women who went to the tomb that early morning and found it empty, one of the Marys there at the tomb uh, was married, says John, to someone named Clopas. Clopas is very similar to Cleopas. In fact, it's the male version of Cleopatra. So when Luke says Cleopas and another were walking down this road toward Emmaus, we can assume we're talking about Clopas and his wife Mary. And even if you don't go with the scholars in that kind of research, I've always assumed that this this couple is an older, maybe uh, married couple, followers of Jesus in their marriage and followers of Jesus together. And here this couple is walking down Uh, the road on that same day, the first day, Easter, and they have a a close encounter of a divine kind. They meet a a stranger along the the road. And Luke doesn't say whether uh, they're frightened by this stranger on the road, although that stranger very well could have been a criminal setting out to rob them. Luke doesn't say whether they they thought he was a vagrant trying to panhandle or work them to get some money or get some food. He just said this person sort of sidled up beside them and began to walk with them. Now, Cleopas and the other disciple were walking with their heads down. They were heavy-hearted with grief. The one they had hoped would be the Messiah, Jesus, had been arrested and crucified and put in a tomb. Oh, there were rumors that maybe he'd been raised from the dead, but they didn't see it for themselves, they told the stranger. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm heavy-hearted with grief, or I'm feeling a little weary by anything, I don't mind being with the people who are closest to me, my family, maybe some close friends, maybe my church family. But I'm not sure I want to be with strangers out on the road. In fact, I was thinking just two years ago, Beth and I uh, walked the northern route of the Camino de Santiago. It's a pilgrimage that a lot of people have made for a thousand years or so. We chose to walk the northern route of the Camino de Santiago because uh, there are fewer people on that route. It's a, it's a more challenging walk. In fact, you had to use the word hike at times. A lot of climbing, steep hills, traversing uh, rivers and riverbeds. It was more challenging, but there were going to be fewer people there. The main route had so many more people, and we said, we've got enough people in our lives already. Wouldn't it be nice to go on this walk by ourselves where we can experience some solitude? maybe reflect on our experience of God and what God was doing in our lives. Every day we walked anywhere from 14 to 20 miles, and we loved it. It was a time to to be alone. Now, we met some strangers along the road every now and then, and we were pleasant, and it was kind of fun in some ways, connecting with people from all over the world. But for the most part, we wanted to be alone. I wonder if the two disciples along the Emmaus Road would have preferred to be alone in their grief, in their sadness. And yet, they agreed to walk with this stranger for a ways. They walked with him for a little while, and as they did, this stranger started opening up the scriptures to them. He started turning on lights, strange lights, that illumined the, 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 the preaching and teaching of Moses and the prophets. This stranger started to connect the dots between what the prophets had been talking about for over a thousand years with what had happened in Jerusalem that weekend. The stranger along the road started connecting the dots with what Jesus himself had been teaching throughout his three-year ministry to what had happened there in Jerusalem that weekend. And they were starting to burn and churn within them. 
They felt very, very close to the truth, something divine, although they couldn't quite put their finger on it. They couldn't quite name it. I wonder if they stole glances with one another as they walked along that road with the stranger and whispered to one another, this means something. It's important. It wasn't till they got to Emmaus and they saw that this stranger was going to have to go on by himself at a later hour, that they opened their hearts to him, and they opened their home to him, and they opened their table to him. They said, it's getting too late. Don't, don't go any further. Stay with us. There was something about that stranger from the road, something about that close encounter of the divine kind that moved them to open their hearts, open their home, and welcome this stranger to their table. And as that stranger sat at their table, took bread, blessed it, and broke it, then their eyes were opened. Then they saw the stranger for who he truly was. It was the risen Christ. They saw him as they welcomed him into their hearts, their home, their table. Then they saw they'd been walking with the risen Christ all along. Imagine that. And as soon as they saw who he was, he, he vanished, almost like a spirit moving on, passing by. He he'd touched their lives, touched their heart, opened them to the scriptures, helped reveal the risen Christ to them, and then moved on. And then they began to talk about how they'd felt out there on the road. They began to remember and talk about how they'd felt on the road. Didn't our hearts burn within us, they said to one another, when he spoke to us of the prophets and Jesus? Didn't our hearts burn within us when he opened those scriptures up to us in our very midst? Didn't our hearts burn within us? Didn't we sense that this meant something, that it was important? Yes, they, they talked about it. The risen Christ and who he was began to become more and more real for them. And they got up and they ran back to Jerusalem, seven miles or so. I know you think it's a long way because you spent a lot of your days in a car. But if you've walked seven miles or 14 miles or even 20 miles every day, seven miles is like a commute from the suburbs. They ran back to Jerusalem to tell the others what they had seen. And they shared with the others uh, that they had seen the risen Christ. They'd, he'd become uh, uh, present to them on the road and present to them in their home, present to them in the breaking of the bread. Do you know there was a, a great preacher from right here in a good state of Georgia? Uh, his name was Fred Craddock. Uh, Fred Craddock pastored a little uh, church up in North Georgia. He was a pastor of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, and he was a professor of preaching and New Testament at uh, Emory University, Candler School of Theology, right here in Georgia. He was named one of the top 20 preachers uh, in the, of the 20th century. Now, I tell you all this because I, I want you to understand that this, this has some, what I'm about to tell you has some gravitas to it. See, Fred Craddock said that we start to recognize the risen Christ in our own lives, not in the moment that it's happening, but in remembrance. That's what Fred called it, remembrance. We start to, to uh, recognize the risen Christ in our lives and, and, and start to understand what that means in our retelling of the story. As the disciples broke bread with Jesus, they recognized him, he left, and then they started to remember didn't our hearts burn within us as we walked along the road? Didn't our hearts uh, burn within us as he opened up the scriptures to us? Uh, they started to understand that Christ had been in their midst. The risen Christ was there all the time as they remembered it with one another. They ran back to Jerusalem and remembered it with the others who were gathered there. And you know what? When they got there, they were remembering their experience too. They said, Simon has seen the risen Christ. In fact, if you want to look at a common thread through all these resurrection stories, what you'll see is not just the risen Christ who they don't recognize at first, but do start to recognize and understand in remembrance. It was there at the tomb uh, when the women saw that the tomb was empty and the angel appeared, they went back 
and remembered. They told the story to the others. It was there in that locked room that night when the risen Christ appeared to a group of them that they remembered it to Thomas. They said, Thomas, we've seen the risen Lord. He's risen. They shared the story and this couple themselves who experienced a a close encounter of the divine kind on the Emmaus Road and recognized that the risen Christ had been with them all along. They, They remembered it with one another and then they shared it with the other disciples back in Jerusalem. You know, when I think about those two disciples remembering their experience of the risen Christ there at the table, I was thinking about something that I miss very much during this time of COVID-19 pandemic. Of all the things I missed, miss, and there are plenty of things I miss right now, just like you, one of the things I miss the most is coffee hour. I miss coffee hour and I miss our our third Sunday congregational lunches here at MPC and I miss going out to to lunch with friends from the church every Sunday after worship. Beth and I were talking about this last week, how meaningful it is to worship with you all online, but then we get in the car and we drive home alone and we go back to that place of safe shelter or sheltering in place. What we miss is the opportunity of remembrance with one another. We miss those opportunities to lift up the stories of our own experiences, those close encounters of the divine kind that we've all had. And in remembering with one another, recognizing that the risen Christ has been with us all along. You know, there's an old gospel hymn that we sing in this church every now and then. You probably are familiar with it. It's a bit of a prayer, and it's called Just a Closer Walk with Thee. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. I was thinking that maybe the song shouldn't be a prayer asking God to walk close with us. Maybe the prayer should be, uh, uh, the hymn should be a prayer asking uh, the Lord to let us see the ways that Christ has been walking with us all along. Just a closer walk with thee. Grant it, Jesus, let me see. Daily walking close to thee, let me see, dear Lord, let me see. I think we see in the remembrance as we share uh, times with each other online, in Zoom meetings and Zoom Bible studies, when we share, when we gather with friends after worship online these days, to talk about the ways the risen Christ has been working in our lives. Folks, it's no secret, we are living in some rather uncertain days, aren't we? For our generation, no matter how young or how old you are, these are perhaps some of the most, uh, the, 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 a time of greatest phenomenon. We will remember this time. But during this time, the risen Christ is with us even now. We are having a close encounter of a divine kind even through all of this. I believe we'll start to recognize it as we start to talk about it. Talk about it with one another, how we've experienced Christ this week. How are we experiencing God's promise of hope in this moment? How are we experiencing God's promise of uh, of hope for a better tomorrow, even as we work our way through an uncertain time? And I believe as we share those stories, as we share the stories of hope and promise, we'll start to see that the risen Christ has been walking with us all along. Friends, I pray that we continue to have close encounters of the divine kind this week. And when you start to churn and burn within yourself and you start to feel like this means something, it's important. I pray that you find a way to connect with others, whether it be in a Zoom gathering, messenger, even just a note shared back and forth, You could even do old school snail mail with one another. But talk about the ways. Talk about the ways that the risen Christ has come to you and has journeyed with you. And as you do, I pray that we are blessed. Blessed with the presence of Christ and we start to recognize him in our midst. 
not just tomorrow, not just after the fact, but even now. Friends, this means something. It's important. Praise be to God. Amen.